Back in 2001, um, I was here in New York. I was working as an architect, and uh, I was still at home that morning when I heard that the World Trade Center had been hit by an airplane, and I thought it must have been an accident, and I grabbed my camera and went up to the roof of our apartment building in the East Village and saw the second plane uh, hit the South Tower. And you knew immediately that it was no accident. Um, and it's one of those moments that if you witness it, you never forget. Um, and I think in a large part that was being here in New York that day and witnessing the attacks and witnessing the way New Yorkers responded um, was responsible for my reaction um, and my need to, to find a way to express myself. And so I started to sketch because that was my, my means of communication. And so for a year I sketched and built models and eventually constructed a small fountain that captured that idea of, uh, of a surface of water shorn open, forming two square voids. And I took it up to the rooftop of my uh, East Village apartment and photographed it against the skyline where I'd once seen the towers. And I spent close to a year doing that, and it was entirely a self-directed cathartic exercise for me. And when I completed it, I took the model and put it on a on a shelf in a closet and forgot about it for, for quite a bit of time. And I came back to it a year later, following the selection of a master plan for the site, following the announcement of a competition to design a memorial. And that was really the first, in my mind, open uh, process in the whole process of rebuilding Ground Zero, because everything up until that point had been uh, you know, a closed competition, if you want to call that, for the selection of the master plan, for the selection of this architect or that. And here there's finally a, an open call to the public for anyone to participate. And I felt compelled to, to revisit the ideas that I had studied the year before for a memorial on the Hudson River and see if I were to build on the site, what would I build and what part of those ideas could I bring into this next iteration of thinking about a memorial. Um, and there were two very important and fundamental ideas which guided my thinking. One was that sense of rupture, of absence, of trying to make something visible and present and tangible uh, using emptiness, using nothingness. And that's a hard thing to do anywhere, but especially in New York City, which is all about this sort of density and noise. And, um, and another building on top of another and on top of another. And the other idea was public space, that it was very important to make this site a place for, that, that carried within it the, the notion of a democratic public space, a civic space that I had experienced myself, the importance of those spaces in the days that followed 9-11. So it was places like Washington Square and Union Square and the way they brought us together and allowed us, without ceremony, without speeches, simply to stand next to each other. And I thought that was very important to bring to the site. And I thought that the guidelines for the memorial competition um, did not necessarily allow for that to happen. They actually created a, a space for the memorial that was cut off from the city, that was removed from it. Um, it was, and I could understand the, the impulse to sort of shelter it and hide it, and, um, but I actually wanted to open it and make it part of the public realm. And so I entered the memorial competition without really a strong sense of win this. It was more a polemical exercise for me. It was, you know, like writing a letter to the editor. You don't think your, your letter to the editor is going to change a policy. Um, and here I sent a proposal and that I worked on very hard, but I thought, you know, these are the guidelines that I'm doing something completely different. But the reason for why I was doing something completely different came from, from my own experiences. And I think the jury that 
uh, looked at these 5,200 entries uh, was also looking for something that would challenge these guidelines and would um, work off of the strength of the master plan, but also challenge it in other ways. Yeah, I think what drove me more than anything was being here in New York and witnessing the events of that day and then witnessing the way people responded. And if you would have told me, you know, a week before the attacks that I would go out and buy an American flag and hang it in my window the following week, I would have said, I can't, no. But I was compelled to do that because I felt such a sense, uh, and I think this was a universal feeling. I think we all felt like we were in it together. In every corner of the world, uh, we, I think the world came together, the United States came together, and it came together for, for a brief period of time, and we can argue about why that sense of solidarity evaporated when it did. But for a period of time, there was that sense of solidarity that we were all together in this. I, I think one of the challenges of this memorial is that it had to convey both individual loss and collective loss. There, there is that number, right, close to 3,000 dead. You know. 2,982 names that are commemorated on the memorial. And then there's the individuality of each and every name. And how does a memorial acknowledge both? That, that, that sense of communal loss is made up of many individual losses. Um, and in the arrangement of the names, one thing that was very important to me was to give each and every name a space on the memorial that felt unique to that person um, and not a list of numbers or letters. And you can see that in the way the names are arranged on the memorial panels. They're not arranged in rows or columns. They're arranged in a, in a ribbon which runs around each pool. And the names are staggered intentionally to give a physical place on the memorial that belongs to each and every person. Um, and that was uh, a challenge on many different levels to, I mean, on the simplest level of, of sort of graphic um, presentation on the memorial so that the names have a consistent grain to them, if you will, that each name has a space around it that belongs to it. But on a more um, challenging and emotional level, it was how do we give the relationship of each name in relationship to the names around it, like a constellation of stars. Um, how do we imbue that with meaning? That there's a reason why this name is next to that name and that name is next to this name. And the way that we went about it uh, was to reach out to the family members and ask them, are there names of other people who perished on that day that you would like to see the name of the person that you lost? You'd like to see their name next to them whether they were friends or family members or co-workers. We thought we had a great idea, but we didn't quite know how we would be able to implement it, nor did we know what kind of level of engagement we would have from these families. And we got over 1,200 requests for adjacencies, and it was sort of, sort of beware of what you wish for. Now we had to take all of these requests and find a way of synthesizing the names arrangement in a way that would meet the, the sort of simple criteria that I talked about earlier of, graphically arranging the names so that each name fell into the appropriate group which defined it and the groups were based on geography, where people were that day, whether it was the North Tower, the South Tower, the Pentagon, or the Four Flights, but also that responded to requests from family members. Could you put this name next to this name? And in the process of soliciting this information, we learned a lot about some of the victims and their families. So one of the requests that we got was from a young woman who lost her father that day, and she lost her best friend from college, who happened to work in the North Tower. Her father was on Flight 11, the plane that crashed into the North Tower. And we were able to bring their names next to one another. His name is under the group Flight 11, her name is under World Trade Center. 
And when you walk by the memorial, you would not know that there is a relationship between these names. It's a relationship that's invisible to, to most people, but it's visible and known to many people who, who knew them. And when they visit the memorial, it's a, it's a meaningful connection that we've made uh, for them. We've embedded that meaning in the memorial. I think that line of names, which, which forms the perimeter around H. Void, is an incredibly powerful moment of walking up to a line that separates the living from the dead, encountering them, but not being able to go past that line. And I, and that was one of the things that I thought was very important to do here, to, to bring people to, to that edge, um, to let that space be a space which is a space for contemplation, a space for That, that halts your everyday life for a second. It's as if you've hit a pause button and you're neither in the city nor outside of the city or in this in-between space. It was a very long journey and uh, I feel that we were able to preserve the, the character of the memorial through that journey and it could have very easily become something altogether different. It could have become a memorial that was bellicose or jingoistic or self-pitying. And for me, it was very important to not let the memorial slide into that territory, but to keep it where it was, which reflected what I had seen in New York, which was a very um, a stoic and defiant yet compassionate memorial. And those were qualities that I saw here in New York that impressed me greatly and that I wanted to, to see in the memorial.